If you don't know me, my name's Jen Ives. I'm a stand-up comedian and a writer. Um, but if you don't know me for any of that stuff, I was the one who got screamed and shouted at when I crashed the LGB Alliance conference. Um, if I can find it, I'll put a clip of that here now. You, you were disingenuous earlier. You said to me, you said to me, you didn't even know as a man, and you used the she pronoun. The worst thing well, now you're a he, because I know you're a he. I can't be shaking. I you are a he. And it's no good trying to take them all high ground. You are a mentally ill, autogynophilic pervert, and you need to leave. So here's the thing. Being a trans woman is kind of difficult at the moment in the United Kingdom. Um, it's kind of a pain in the ass a little bit. And on the one hand, I don't like to just talk about trans issues. Um, my comedy doesn't really... Like my stand-up comedy, it doesn't really contain much trans-related stuff anymore. And it can, I'm aware, get a bit, you know, depressing the way that things are. But I do very much care. I, I care about it. So I thought, well, I'll make a kind of brand, a channel, a multi-platform media hub and call it Woman Face and that will contain podcasts, video podcasts and audio ones, um, video essays, mini documentaries, sketches that all revolve around trans existence and that's what you're watching now the the first sort of introduction to that this is a simplified rough version i guess of the podcast that i am going to be working on over the next few months which will be focused on interviewing interesting trans people trans creatives trans people in tv and media and whatever about what it's like, you know, how they got there, what they've been doing, how they how they cope on a day-to-day -day basis with all this bloody noise. But today, for now, in lieu of that, while we wait, I thought I would just jump on and, and, and sort of introduce myself and do kind of a mini episode, you know, kind of a little episode just to wet the whistle and have something up on the channel so you can uh, so you can so you can see that I'm serious about it I guess the main thing that I'm trying to achieve with this project is a kind of light-hearted sideways glance at the existential social side of being a trans person. I'm not looking for debates. I'm not going to be sitting down with any pieces of shit. I'm mainly going to be talking to other trans people about how we got into this darn mess in the first place. And hopefully you'll enjoy it and it'll be entertaining and funny for you. Because God knows, I've got the time at the moment. I could, I could, I could take this camera anywhere, and I plan to. The streets, backstage, the bottom of the ocean. I won't, well, I won't be doing that one. That's not going to happen. Um, but today, what I thought I'd talk about is. The new Channel 4 documentary, Gender Wars, that I watched last night, um, and, and the subsequent hysteria that seems to have exploded on my Twitter account. So let's just 
let's just start with gender wars. I, I think I'm going to do something a little bit more in depth about gender wars at a later date after I've had some time to process it. But basically what gender wars is, um, no, it's not the worst ever sequel to Star Wars. <laughs> um, no, it's a documentary made by Channel 4. I say documentary, I mean, what it really is, is a puff piece, a piece of propaganda to present the professor, her most honourable Kathleen Stock, um, as a victim and as a bit of a crybaby, actually. So basically, it's, you know, it's Channel 4 wading into the debate and trying to portray both sides. And look, when are we going to stop this? When are we going to stop this both sidesism? There aren't, there's not two sides. There's like, we're not dealing with a coin here. We're not even dealing with a die. We're dealing with some kind of strange, abstract, fourth dimensional shape. What I'm saying is there's a lot of sides to this and, and, and the more that these documentaries, whatever, perpetuate that there are only two sides, the kind of stupider it all seems to become. Um, but listen, I watched it. You know, I, I sat through the whole darn thing. It was about 45 minutes, 50 minutes long, not including ad breaks. And look, The Guardian gave it four stars, okay? But The Guardian sucked dick. The Guardian are like, I don't know if there's anyone out there who still thinks that The Guardian is like the paper of the people, the people paper, because it ain't. The Guardian is, is a paper for people who think they're progressive and don't want to do any work to become more progressive um, and just want to be sort of tucked into a nice little bed and, and told you're very progressive and it's okay that you don't like trans people that's that's the guardian so and also they give four stars to a load of old shit trust me i've been to edinburgh i know but i watched it you know i'm not one of these i'm not one of these chumps He's gonna gonna criticize the thing if I haven't watched it. I opened both my eyes individually, one, two, and I looked at the screen and I said, "Right, it's watching time." And I did. I, I watched. I watched the shit out of it. I watched the bloody flipping shit out of that documentary. And you know what? It was. It was a. It was a mess. It was a mess. It, it really was just mainly focused on Kathleen Stock, with the occasional, you know talking head from a trans person, a very, you know, very calm, very, you know, emotional trans person saying, you know, we just want, we just want to be accepted. It's like that, which is obviously great. But then when you've got like the whole rest of the documentary focusing on Kathleen Stock looking sad in various places and saying, oh, I, I was so scared to go to the Oxford Union because everyone thinks I'm a transphobe and there's nothing I can say to convince anyone otherwise now. I think the thing that annoys me the most about the Gender Wars documentary, aside from its objectively terrible title, that's the funny thing with these documentaries, like they claim to put a lot of work and effort into making these docs. Like, oh, we've got researchers and we've got like, a, a camera, you know, real effort they put in. But then when it gets to the naming of the documentary, I think they just put a bunch of words in a hat. Like, it's a war. What kind of a war? It's a gender war. But it wasn't a war. There's no war. I'll tell you why it's not a war. Because there's no bit in the documentary where they talk about that, that, that beautiful day, that Christmas day, when the trans-exclusionary radical gender critical TERFs and the uh, extreme trans rights activist autogynophilic uh, 
TIM lady boys um, had a truce and decided for just one day to play football out in the ice in that beautiful ceasefire and then the trans women won because obviously they have a biological physical advantage in all sports and so the war started again I might be getting my histories mixed up I'm not sure what I'm saying is gender wars is a terrible title and they should really get someone on that to to try harder maybe maybe come up with something better but it disappointed me as a fan of Channel 4 you know Channel 4 has always had a reputation of being the edgy channel you know this ain't your grandma's channel we're channel four we've got graham norton and we're gonna show you a dick on tv in the late 90s early 2000s and some of my favorite programs ever were first broadcast on channel four some of my favourite comedies are Channel 4 comedies. I have a very fond relationship with Channel 4. Heck! 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 I've been on Channel 4. I was in Joe Lysett's Big Pride Party on Channel 4. I was a voice in Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared on Channel 4. I've done various bits of uh, Channel 4 online, sort of pseudo-taskmaster, um... In Practical Jokers esque hidden camera prank shows. I like Channel 4. I used to watch Big Brother. Okay? I'm not anti Channel 4. In fact, I love Channel 4 so darn much that last year Channel 4 themselves invited me to an inclusivity panel, sort of, and they filmed it. It's like an internal thing where they get a bunch of different. Uh, sort of people from a minority class together in a room and they film it and it's like a chat that Monroe Bergdorf was there and lo lo like loads of like really cool trans creatives and basically they sit down and they say hmm you know how can we at Channel 4 do better for the trans community how can we do that you know how can we how can we create m more more nuanced, interesting programming um, that will that will appease you, uh, transgenders. And we all say the same thing time and time again. And we did on that day. We said, "Well, do you know what actually be great would be to have less uh, inflammatory documentaries about us, with quite a simplistic worldview and a gender critical leaning." Um, and it would be better if you let some trans people actually make some stuff just once or tw just a little bit maybe just a tiny a tiny scrap of us telling our own stories you know and they were like hmm yeah that's such an interesting um, sort of out of the box idea wow real wow real real cool stuff thanks and they gave us free croissants and uh, a can of coke and a little pat on the bum and we left you know in good spirits thinking hey channel 4 does care channel 4 does want to want to do something different and i remember saying you know channel 4 is the the channel of edge it's known for that it's god it's edgy um but what the edgiest thing they could do would be in my opinion, nowadays, to be truly edgy, I think, in this goddamn landscape, is to take a firm stance on the rights of trans people, like unequivocally. So imagine how I must have felt when I heard about this Gender Wars documentary coming out. And I looked at the, um, the producers of this documentary's past works, and I didn't get a whole lot of confidence from that, but you know, I gave it the benefit of the doubt and I watched it and, and yeah, it, I have to say, I really do have to say that it's bad. I think there will be a lot of people that walk away from that doc thinking, oh yeah, I guess that was quite balanced because they did interview some trans people on it. 
But when the documentary itself is such a, seemingly such a celebration of Kathleen Stock and such a sort of pity party for her as a, as a silenced academic, which there's no real evidence to suggest she's been silenced at all. In fact, the promo leading up to and after this documentary, it's been a bit exhausting. It's like Kathleen Stock's on this radio show, she's on this TV channel, she's on this bloody podcast or whatever, she's everywhere. Kathleen Stock, she's, she's, she's the new Coke. She's everywhere, everyone wants a bit of Kathleen Stock. And essentially the message of, of Kathleen Stock and Julie Bindle, um, who also appeared in the documentary, was, listen, we don't think that trans people aren't entitled to rights, their own rights. Listen, we think trans people should be able to live and exist in society. We just don't think they should have access to facilities that would support and help them based on their lived experience and social experience. Because at the end of the day, isn't that the real kind of elephant in the room? They can say, you know, they can whine about women's uh, sex-based rights must be protected and, you know, trans women aren't real women. But guess what? On a day-to-day -day basis in society, we sure got a hell of a lot of uh, overlaps. And I don't care what you think, really. Ultimately, I, when you know, when I see a gender-critical person or a turf, and they say you're not a woman, I mean, I get that a lot. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. I don't care what you think. I care about what my friends and family think and I care about how I move through society. I couldn't give a flying toss about what a stranger thinks about that. But what I do care about is the quality level of my life. So until these gender critical people can come up with a solution, because the problem is there's a lot of moaning there's a lot of there's a lot of whining from them until they can actually come up with a viable solution that makes sense and works i don't want to hear it they don't have any real answers that's the thing they really don't they they can't they're, they're intrinsically conservative in the way they think and with kathleen stock i'm always surprised at how someone who uh identifies as <laughs> <laughs> a philosopher. Um, I'm always surprised how sort of limited her brain capacity is when thinking about social identity. Maybe she's just one of those old-fashioned philosophers. She's the kind of philosopher who finds her philosophy and then she draws a line in the sand and says, do you know what? That's it, that is. There's nowhere to go from here. I've, I've done philosophy. I've figured it out and philosophy's over. We can close the book on that. So anyway, moving on. I was frustrated by the documentary. I did a tweet thread, mildly, very, very mildly, razzing it um, and Kathleen Stock. One of the big surprises that I got from the documentary was that Kathleen Stock's coffee maker, because you got to look into her um, home, her, co her coffee maker's rubbish. She's got one of those like metal coffee makers that you have to like put on the hob. And I just thought someone of her esteem, you know, someone who is making that much money off the anti-trans grift, I was like, come on, like you must have like a, an electric coffee maker or something, an espresso machine, at least. There is one scene where she's wearing this Adidas two-piece tracksuit with like green piping up and down the, the legs and arms. And look, if I have to concede anything, I will concede this. Professor Stock, she's got drip. She looks cool. 
She's got some style. I've always thought that about Stock. Uh, just, just, to, just to be fair to Stock, I think her ideas are bullshit, and I think she's a crybaby and stupid. But what you'll never ever hear me say about Stock is that she doesn't have style, because she does. It's hard when you like someone's style, but you can't get on board with them as a person, you know? So anyway, I did this one tweet, right? Which was a picture of Kathleen Stock that was recently taken at some kind of Oxford or Cambridge Union, I don't know which one, but she's sitting in this chair, right? And she's sitting like, sort of like this, uh, with her legs spread out. Um, and I said something along the lines of, only biological men sit like this. Um, trans investigation incoming. And I posted it. And I didn't really think much of it, you know, because it's pretty on brand for my Twitter account. I'm, I'm a bit of a rascal on that, I'm not gonna lie. I'm a bit of a scamp, a scallywag. I do this thing that not a lot of people over the age of 40 quite grasp on Twitter, which is called shit posting, and it's actually a, a very fundamental, important part of my life. The, the thing about satire is, the worst kind of satire is satire that you have to explain. But after seeing the reaction to the to that post, I genuinely feel a bit of despair at the sort of willful ignorance of some of the public. And I'm not just talking about no display picture, anonymous freaks. I'm talking about some very, very minor celebrities also. Obviously I was making a point about the absurdity of using biology uh, to dictate mannerisms. And I was playing a character of someone who is saying something actually transphobic. If you know anything about the transvestigation phenomenon, it's people who believe that everyone is trans, basically. Not everyone, but like, lot, they believe that a lot of public figures, like Michelle Obama and like, Tom Cruise or like, and like they believe they're trans and they do these like ridiculous deep dives into analyzing their bone structure and how they sit and all this kind of like phrenological rubbish. And I was just doing a parody of that, but involving Kathleen Stock because she's a bit topical at the moment. Well, boy howdy, I woke up this morning and my Twitter was going crazy. My phone was blowing up. My phone's been buzzing all day. It's been buzzing like some kind of animal that buzzes a bumblebee, probably. It's been going crazy. And the reason why it was buzzing so crazy is because it was retweeted by a couple of different people with significantly large followings. One is this guy called Graham Linehan. You probably haven't heard of him. He's just this loser, but he, but he, he did it and that got a lot of attention. I'll, I'll, do you know what would be fun? I'll, I'll tell you what they tweeted, so. So Graham Linehan uh, retweeted it and he said, how would you know, you unfunny goblin? Um, it got a retweet from a comedian. I've never, I don't think I've ever performed with her, but I'm vaguely aware of her. She's called Abby Roberts. She said, at Jen Ives Comedian, that's my username, is one of a woke group of comedians who will find themselves on the wrong side of history. Their views, there, okay, I guess I'm non-binary now, their views are so absurdly regressive and warped. 
Here's to the growing wave of comedy that skewers this utter fucking nonsense. I think, from what I know about her, she considers herself kind of like, like edgy, like like she's pushing boundaries. Like, oh, I'm going on Comedy Unleashed. I'm going to say what I want. But the thing they always want to say is, trannies are men. I mean, that's okay. I don't believe in vaccines. Probably, I don't know. Birdie Rose, who's apparently an, an artist with quite a, a big following, um, she retweeted it. She said, women can sit however they want. I know that shocks you, but there isn't a sitting position that women have to adhere to. We're not living in a Jane Austen novel for Pete's sake. I added the Pete's sake. Again, just taking the tweet a hundred percent at face value and this has been really interesting for me because i think what it demonstrates is is that these people are so already geared up to or they already want to hate trans people so much that they will latch on to even the stupidest most innocuous joke and i'm not going to say that they actually believe it i, I think they i think they're, I think it's willful ignorance. I think they're pretending. It's, a, it's actually, ironically, virtue signaling. At it's almost like purest form. Because it's them pointing and going, look, we told you, misogyny. But it's like, it's not, you're, you're being dumb. And when I say she's an artist, also this um, Birdie Rose, if that is your real name, another transvestigation is put in the diary. Um, I think she does like turf art. If that is, I, mean, I think that's a genre now. You know, it's like, you know, people holding like a, a suffragette flag or whatever and saying, my nan was a witch and you couldn't burn her. And also Magdalene Burns is my hero because she died. One of the more recent retweets I got from it was Dawn Neesom, who is a presenter on TV and GB News now, I think. And she said, women being told how to sit. And there we thought the handmaid's tale was a work of fiction. My favorite retweet that I got was from the actor Amanda Abington who, if you don't know, she was in Sherlock and she was in Inside Number Nine, a show that I really quite like, actually. Um, she said, again, my, remember my tweet was, um, this is not how biological women sit. She said, it is, we do, mad, right? She has a very significant following, so, as you can imagine, today I have been getting a lot of DMs, a lot of open comments just saying you're disgusting, you're misogynist, you're homophobe. And I have loved every single one. See, the thing about me is that I do think helps me to stand apart from other uh, extreme radical trans rights activists, as they've liked to dub me, um, is that I actually couldn't give a fly for I actually love it. I actually love the attention, whether it's positive or negative, like, like what I am, the way I imagine myself is like a little trap spider. You know, those spiders that like hide in like a little, like they make a little uh, hatch door and they just wait, you know, they put out their little thing and they wait. And then sooner or later, some goofy ass bug comes along and they see it and they go, Oh, it's dinner time, and they go over to eat it, and then guess who strikes? Me. I come out. <sighs> anyway, I just wanted to talk about it because I thought it was really funny, and it's still happening now. Like, every time I look at my Twitter, it has that 20 plus notifications thing. It's non-stop. 
Um, I'm really quite proud of it. I, I hope that they put that tweet that I did of Kathleen Stock up in a museum and then have like a rolling, like a screen next to it with like a rolling um, feed of all the responses just to show how absolutely egregious and silly the current gender critical movement is. Because you really are silly, you're making yourself look like a bit of a, like a little bit of a lemon. And look, I like lemons. I wouldn't want to look like one, and guess what, you look like one. You look like a, you look like lemons. But it wasn't just the famous people, the glitterati, who were, um, who were critiquing me on the internet. I had a lot of interesting comments from anonymous Twitter accounts with like seven followers, but also with a blue tick, who had things like this to say. A shitty wishwig makes a really ugly munter of a Tim. If you don't know, a Tim is a trans identified male. That's one of the buzz slogans that a lot of turfy trans exclusionary radicals uh, gender critical people they're trying to really like make that stick trying to make it popular is that sometimes you'll hear them say trans woman as like a different like to differentiate from woman but sometimes if they're feeling particularly like cunty you know if they're in like a cunt 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 cunt, cunt mood they'll say tim uh, they'll say you're a trans identified male you're a man who identifies as a trans you're a Tim. They love that. And in fact, Julie Bindle loves it so much that she had a, a lovely opportunity from Channel 4 last night to, to say it on television. So good for her. Here's another one that I liked. The correct way for a woman to sit is as far away as possible from Jen Ives. The same is also true for men. So what that person is saying in that comment is Women should stay away from me, for, what, for whatever reason, I'm not sure. But also, so should men. Everyone should. I should be ostracised. And um, I just think that was really funny, really clever, really witty. A lot of them call me uh, so-called comedian Jen Ives, and I have to say, they're giving me an absolute masterclass in real comedy. I'm not surprised Ives is jealous. Kathleen, with her neat, clean hair and her chic style, epitomizes cool. I never denied that. In fact, scrub back in this video slash podcast, you will hear me saying Kathleen Stock has drip. She's a style icon. She's like a, she's like a hateful Tilda Swinton. And I'm here for it. The unfunny trans comedian reveals their blatant homophobia, gender confusion, addiction to stereotypes and just overall lack of intelligence in one short tweet. Well, I have to say that's quite impressive because the tweet is very short. It's less than 10 words, I think. So I'm really kind of, I've been on Twitter a long time. My current Twitter account I've only had for four years. I used to have another one, but I deleted it because I was trying to give it up, but I came calling back. Um, but I've been on there generally quite a long time since it kind of started and I, I really miss the days where it was like 120 characters or whatever it was, and you had to really be economical. So yeah, I take that as a compliment. I really have mastered unfunny, homophobic, gender confused, stereotypical tweets to their most economical form. I'm kind of like the Kurt Vonnegut of tweeting. So this one I liked, because it's again, it's simple. Man says what? Hashtag trans terrorism. Uh, there's this one. He's rocking that chubby eunuch look. Now, I've not heard that before. I've never been called a chubby eunuch. Um, I wish I was. I wish I could uh, get fast tracked on the old waiting list and get my eunuch on. Unicorn. Eunuch on. Unicorn is the uniform you put on. Eyes on eye when I perform. But, but eunuch. How did you manage to cram so much homophobia and sexism into less than 10 words? The left's own Bernard Manning. 
and then finally says a bloke hashtag woman face so thanks for the promo for my new media venture the other thing that i get a lot when i post anything really on twitter is i get a lot of people comparing me to the little britain actor and writer matt lucas you know the one who's not the evil one the, the good the, the the slightly you know nicer one of not not the one who uh not the one with all the rumors and you, you know what i'm talking about if you know um no matt lucas the one from uh bake off uh yeah they compare me a lot to him and various characters that he's played including vicky pollard um, the I'm a lady uh, characters but I get this so much this this comparison to Matt Lucas and it's not just because of this um, I get it so much and I've got it for so long so often that the only explanation I have and it's a bit of a conspiratorial one but I don't think it's completely out of the realms of possibility is that these little gender critical freaks have their freaky little uh, mum's net style chat rooms where they all gather and they come up with little dossiers on how and when to uh, best insult various trans women they're like this one looks like this let's call this one that because the consistency of it is incredible unless it's just one person who keeps making different accounts in order to call me Matt Lucas but I actually think that's the least likely option I think I think they've decided that I, that that's I'm Matt Lucas. And hey, you know, like I can live with that. Better that than Walliams, right? If you're being compared to Matt Lucas, it's like okay, there's some issues there, but I can get over it. If you're comparing me to David Walliams, then oof, I must be doing something wrong, you know. You know, I realised when I was in that Channel 4 inclusivity meeting that didn't quite pan out in the way we'd all hoped. I kind of had a bit of a revelation where I thought, okay, so I've, I've, we've told them that this is what we need more. Trans people talking to each other, talking for themselves. And they, they don't want to give it to us. They've made that pretty abundantly clear. So I was like, well, I want a camera. I've got a lapel microphone. I've got an inflated sense of self-worth. I'll do it my bloody self. And this is it. And I hope you like it. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Or if there's a third option, I don't know, feel like feeling it like the vibrations either way i hope you enjoyed it and i i'm gonna gonna be interviewing a few people next week and this where you are now this youtube channel is probably the best place to get everything it will be a podcast and there will be written things and blah blah, blah. there will be a website eventually but but mainly the youtube is 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 the central hub and then off of it, there'll be like a TikTok account, blah, 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 all that kind of shit. But, but YouTube is where you want to be. I'd better go now because I'm hungry and I need to make some dinner. Also, since starting this video, I've got another 12.7 million hateful replies to read in my Twitter inbox. So join me again next time at Woman Face the home of existentialist transgender dread. Bye.